So, uh, let's get started. I'm Jessica Skrubbe, and uh, I'm honored uh, that I've uh, been chosen to introduce uh, the speakers in this uh, last panel of today on periodicals, portfolios, and platforms of dissemination. And uh, I will introduce all three speakers, and then they will, will be uh, giving their papers, and we save the questions and answers for uh, the end of this session. The first speaker is Merchepal Shredi, who will be giving a paper on Lajos Kasak and the politics of paper in the Hungarian avant-garde. Mersche is uh, the director of the Petrofi Literary Museum, Kaszak Museum in Budapest, and uh, also a PhD candidate in art history in that same city. His research focuses on the Hungarian avant-garde of the 1910s and 20s, and he specializes on Lajos Kaszak and his magazine. Our second speaker, will be uh, Dr. Amelia Miholka, who uh, holds a PhD in art history from the Arizona State University. She's a specialist on the Romanian avant-garde, and her paper is titled A Romanian Type of Constructivism, Constructivist Prints, 1923 to 1925. Dr. Miholka also has research interest in the Dada movement, trauma and memory in Holocaust art and Cold War performance art. Our third speaker uh, in this session is uh, Fiona uh, Piccolo, who is a contractual PhD candidate at the Univers University Paris, Pantheon saint -Bon, and she will be speaking on a medium platform art form, avant-garde experiments with paper in the original print uh, portfolio. Uh, Fiona has studied art history and modern literature at the University College in Dublin and art history uh, in Paris. And her thesis is uh, focused on the print portfolio in Germany and Austria between the turn of the century and the late 1920s. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation for this conference. I'm really sorry that I cannot be there in person, but I really hope that uh, you can all hear me and uh, I will be able to contribute to the <clears throat> topic of the conference with a uh, special aspect on the Hungarian avant-garde. In this presentation, I aim towards an analysis of the politics of paper in the Hungarian avant-garde magazine Ma, or Today, between 1919 and 1925. My focus lies both on the material and symbolic aspects of paper for the editor of the magazine Lajos Kossák. Through uh, three case studies, I intend to place an editorial attitude towards paper into the context of this conference. Lajos Kaszak was a poet, a writer, a visual artist, and the organizer of the Hungarian avant-garde movement. He started his career during the early 1910s and created his magazine Ma during the First World War. Kaszak's movement was influenced by Italian futurism and German expressionism. However, uh, Kosciak always stressed his distance from any particular movements. Kosciak was coming from a working class background and he was committed to the socialist cause. His movement was, from the beginning, highly political, but always independent of party directives. Kosciak, as an outsider of both the socialist movement and the mainstream literary culture, struggled to uphold his magazines uh, and his movement in Hungary during the First World War and in exile in Vienna during the first half of the 1920s. For his magazine, uh, uh, the, uh, providing the uh, production costs, the necessary paper and uh, supply <clears throat> uh, was always a, 
an issue, a constant struggle. My first case study thus deals with the difficulties of paper supply in the production of Koshak's avant-garde magazine. Koshak had different kinds of troubles with providing paper to print his eventually internationally renowned periodical. Koshak started Ma in November 1916 and based the magazine's design and appearance on Herwart Walden's Der Sturm from Berlin. Koshak was in contact with the German expressionist magazine and basically copied most of its complex program that comprised uh, a book co uh, publishing operation, a drama school and performance evenings, as well as the opening of a contemporary art gallery. Koshak's objective was a comprehensive operation that would give all avant-garde artists in Hungary the opportunity to lead the public. Koshak also adapted the programmatic use of avant-garde visual arts in his magazine from Der Sturm, placing reproductions of artworks and original linoleum cuts by his fellow artists and German expressionists on the cover pages of Ma. In Budapest, Koshak searched for investors uh, to his magazine and eventually created a corporation with a socialist-oriented merchant to back up his uh, operation financially. Ma also had a growing audience and many subscribers who received limited edition amateur copies of the magazine printed on high quality paper. After the First World War and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy in 1918, Hungary faced uh, two subsequent political revolutions. First, a liberal democratic government was formed in October 1918, and in March, March 1919, the communists uh, took uh, power and created the Hungarian Soviet Republic. Koszak and his movement supported the communist regime and tried to further strengthen the role of their magazine and avant-garde art in general in the new state. Koshak was able to secure more financial support for his magazine. Ma enjoyed a high level of support during the Soviet Republic. The magazine carried more content, appeared with its title printed in red, and came out uh, twice monthly. The expressionist art of Sándor Bortnik uh, was the basis of a new image that suited the magazine's new program. Koshak defined their movement as activism based on German expressionist examples. However, by June 1919, the Hungarian Soviet Republic faced serious paper shortage and authorities seized the printing of uh, most of the non-essential publications. The last Budapest issue of Ma appeared in the, on the 1st of July, 1919. In the following weeks, most literary and artistic periodicals ceased publishing, leaving only the daily newspapers uh, essential for the propaganda of the Soviet Republic, and even those uh, publications appeared with fewer pages. On the 8th of July, Koshak wrote a letter to the National Council of Intellectual Products concerning the order made three days before to suspend the publication of Ma, owing the scarcity of paper. He noted that, and I quote, we have 20,000 sheets of paper allocated to us by the paper center in our press. Since the red heading of our magazine is already printed on one side of this paper, uh, this could not be used uh, for printing anything else without a large amount of waste." End quote. Despite all of Koshak's efforts, however, the next issue of Ma was not published in Budapest. It is generally believed that Ma was banned by the leadership of the Soviet Republic. Although no noun documents provides unequivocal uh, evidence that Ma was banned for political reasons other than paper shortage. Uh, the political ban was actually Koshak's later interpretation. Based on his quarrels with the leader of the Soviet Republic, the politician Bela Kun. In the final period of the dictatorship of the proletariat in 1919, 
the communist politicians probably considered Kashak to be an obstructing uh, uh, force uh, against communist interests by his lack of commitment to party politics. Kuhn, in his speech to the party congress in June, condemned Kashak's art as a product of bourgeois decadence. Kashak replied with an open letter where he stood up for his uh, uh, independence from party politics and, uh, and the proof of this independence was that the open letter, despite the ever worsening paper shortage, was printed as a separate pamphlet in several thousand copies without the approval of the National Council for Intellectual Products. Even the letter written by the press control buddy to Koshak leveled its criticism at the circumstances of the open letters publication rather than its content, critical of the uh, leaders of the Soviet Republic. I quote from this letter written to Koshak by the uh, press control buddy, the paper allocation required to print the pamphlet was not permitted either to you or to the printer and thus you should not have written or published the pamphlet and the printer should not have printed it." End quote. Koshak and his associates, therefore, were confident in, of their position even in the summer of 1919, right before the uh, political collapse of the Soviet Republic. They did not look on their ability as, a, as serving, uh, they did not look on their activity as serving party politics, However, a distinguishedly feasible stance in a regime that was struggling uh, with external and internal enemies. Koshak and his group had to flee the political reprisals taken by the Horthy government after the fall of the uh, Hungarian Soviet Republic, and they ended up uh, as political refugees in Vienna. Uh, Koshak stayed in Vienna until 1926, when he was allowed back in the country. Uh, in exile, he faced different problems. Providing the supplies for the magazine became a collective effort of networking and economical struggle during these years. Despite the dire circumstances, Koshak's magazine transformed several times during the Vienna years and developed a unique uh, typographical style that transcended the occasionally low-quality low paper used in the production of the magazine. Due to its political activities during the Soviet Republic in Budapest, Koshak's magazine was banned from Hungary. Subscribers to the magazine were therefore collected in Vienna, and in the neighboring states with Hungarian-speaking minorities, including Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania. When Koshak's magazine was also banned from Czechoslovakia in 1921, he lost most of his subscribers and had to expand his endeavor uh, internationally. Mo appeared several times with German special issues, and Koshak used the universal language of constructivism to, co to communicate to an international audience. He corresponded with editors and artists across Europe, including Theo van Duisburg of The Stale, uh, Tristan Tsara, and Emil Malespin of Manomet. Uh, Koshak was asking uh, for uh, uh, the help of these uh, fellow editors with organizing international subscriptions to Ma. In October 1922, Koshak printed a one-issue magazine called Two Times Two, where he used high-quality paper as a pronounced tool of aesthetical effect and promoted the magazine based on uh, this quality to the international avant-garde community. Koshak published his Dadaist-inspired autobiographical long poem entitled The Horse Dies, The Birds Fly Away in this magazine. It seems that Koshak created this magazine in order to establish a prominent context so that he could print this poem for the first time 
written already during late 1920. The magazine was sent out to Kosciak's international contacts and was used as a tool of networking despite being only in Hungarian. At the same time, also in October 1922, Kosciak changed the format of his magazine called Ma Radically. From then on, the magazine was printed in a square-shaped format, differentiating it radically from any other magazine on the market. The square shape could have been a reference to Kosciak's constructivist program, referencing both uh, Malevich's black square, but also Theo van Duisburg's logo of the style, which uh, van Duisburg used as a denominator of the truly constructivist magazines in Europe, as he called them. Two uh, analogously square-shaped magazines include Versacrum, the publication of the Vienna Secession uh, from the turn of the century, and the Amsterdam architecture magazine Wendingen, uh, that had a cover page designed by Koschak's constructivist colleague Elisitsky in 1921. The square format resulted in an increased production cost, yet Koschak was determined to privilege quality and invention over profitability. Between 1922 and 1925, Mava printed irregularly and appeared only when Koschak and his colleagues were able to provide the costs of paper and printing. Koschak oftentimes invited international collaborators to chip in to production costs. For example, the German architect Arthur Korn, an architect and arti artist collective from Breslau uh, called Das Junge Schlesien, or young Hungarian poets from Budapest, who then could fill some pages of the magazine with their own content. However, Koschak still remained true to his program and created a magazine that was renowned throughout Europe. My second case study focuses on the symbolic aspects of paper in the international networking efforts of Koschak during the 1920s. From 1922 on, Ma placed special importance on displaying its international network with like-minded uh, magazines around the world. This resulted, and I'm going to turn back, this resulted in a unique set of magazine diagrams promoting constructivist periodicals on the back cover of some of the issues of Ma. However, Koschak, when he started his own visual artistic ventures inspired by Dada publications in 1921, created a series of Dada collages using cut-out parts of title pages of international avant-garde magazines he had access to during the time. Some of these collages were reproduced in Ma and were used as an early tool of networking, stressing the importance of an international outlook for Koschak. On the left side of this slide, I show the only Dada collage of Koschak uh, uh, now to exist today. This collage was last exhibited during the 1960s and reappeared at an auction early this year. In this collage, Koschak used cutouts from a poster of the Vienna uh, Deutsches Volkstheater, as well as a large letter G from the title page of one of the Vienna daily newspapers. On the right side of the slide, you can see a collage by Koschak that is not known in original today, but it was reproduced in the magazine during 1921. This collage used cut out letters from, a from the title page of the Vienna Hungarian daily newspaper called Bécsi Magyar Újság, and Koschak, uh, uh, to which Koschak was a regular contribu contributor and uh, the, the daily was printed it at the same printing house and as his uh, own magazine. In the middle of this collage, we could identify cutouts from a Paris Dada publication, the poster of the fake trial organized by Tristan Tsara against the French writer Maurice Barré. As we know that this poster was around 30 centimeters wide, we can assume that Koschak's collage was also uh, rather large in size originally. 
From Rata recollections of Koshak's colleagues regarding uh, Koshak's turn to visual arts, we can reconstruct that he was largely influenced by Kurt Schwitters' Mertz technique. Koshak published artworks and poetry of Schwitter cinema early in 1921, but he was already corresponding with him during 1920. Schwitters' Dada art was an, init an initial influence of new post-First World War art for Koshak, who adapted the language and designs of Dada during 1921. His usage of Dada materials in his collages, printed and circulated internationally in his magazine, were tools of self-representation self and self-positioning in the newly formed international networks of avant-garde groups across Europe. My final uh, case study deals with the, with, an, with an afterlife of this collage technique in Koshak's oeuvre, as well as the politics of paper in post-war international art market. Separated from avant-garde artistic uh, life during the 1950s in communist Hungary, Koshak returned to the international art stream, a scene from 1960 with a series of exhibitions in Paris partly initiated by Viktor Vazarelli. Coming from a Hungarian background, Vazarelli was keen on presenting Koshak as his master from Hungary, and eventually he convinced the gallerist uh, Denis René to exhibit Koshak's works uh, for the first time in Paris. Even though Koshak was creating visual artworks throughout his later years, the international market demanded the supply of his early Dada and constructivist works that were lost by that time. Koshak himself did not take care, good care of his early artworks, partly because during the 1950s he was suppressed, suppressed by the newly formed communist regime in Hungary. The post-war Stalinist regime considered Koshak a formalist and he was not allowed to publish his poetry and exhibit his artworks. To fill the void and supply the demand of the art market, Koshak, encouraged by Vazarelli, turned his collection of avant-garde magazines, used his collection of avant-garde magazines to create new Dada collages. He then dated these new collages to the early 1920s. His actions resulted in a confusion over Koshak's actual Dada artworks and his later collages that still affects the presentation of his art today. This means that many of Koshak's early artworks in international collections are authentic works by Koshak, but these were not really created during the 1920s, but rather during the early 60s. This is unfortunately not documented in Koshak's archives, so, so we still have a, a large research ahead of us to identify and distinguish Koshak's original Dada collages from those created in the 1960s. I would like to thank you for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen now. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for having me here today, even if it is online. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Today I'm going to be discussing Romanian constructivism. And specifically, I'm looking at the constructivist woodcut and line of, print, uh, line of cut prints that Romanian avant-garde artist Marcel Iancu, uh, or Marcel Ianco as he's known in West, particularly during the Dada period, uh, avant-garde Romanian artist M.H. Maxi and Romanian avant-garde artist and later surrealist Victor Browner. They created these prints for Romanian avant-garde magazines in the 1920s. Romanian constructivism wet the geometric objectivity, architectonic abstraction, and calculated order of the constructivism tendency from the Soviet Union, with characteristics that are unique to Romanian avant-garde prints, such as expressionist features of subjectivity, stark black and white contrast, lyricism, and free-flowing lines and movements. 
is situated within the tradition of relief printing and art and within Dadaist abstraction. The print signified the Romanian avant-gardist concern with keeping up with formal trends in constructivist art and with developing their own practice through constructivism, uh, rather than a concern for the Soviet revolutionary politics of constructivism. Instead of reinforcing the partition of constructivism into two store strands of the Soviet Union and the other of the West and Central Europe, uh, Romanian constructivist art can be considered a third strand or another strand and is a versatile movement whose abstract style could be molded to meet individual and regional artistic needs. Between 1923 and 1925, the Romanian avant-garde magazines Contemporanul, Punct, and 75 HP were the main outlet through which artists disseminated the constructivist prints. Aside from MH Maxi's 1923 exhibition in Bucharest, which included his constructivist art, the avant-garde mounted no other exhibition of constructivist works. Moreover, they did not release their constructivist art in standalone limited edition prints or albums of prints. There was no need to do so, since the magazines were readily available for them to publish woodcuts and lino cuts in consecutive issue numbers. For example, of all the magazines, and under its uh, subtitle, uh, the magazine of international constructivist art, the magazine Punct devotes ample space to constructivist art in its pages. It features constructivist prints in all of its 16 issue numbers, from November 1924 to March 1925. The Dustin North Congress and the International Data Constructivist Congress, both in 1922, were significant for constructivism in Romania and the Romanian avant-garde magazines. The two congresses sped up momentum for constructivist art in Romania as the constructivists convened a few months before the Romanian magazines began printing constructivist art in their issues in 1923. The congresses situate the Romanian avant-garde at constructivism's early beginnings in Western Europe. None of the Romanian avant-gardes participated in the Dusseldorf Congress, but Hans Richter, a formal data is colleague of Marcel Janko and Tristan Zara, represented them in his statement that he presented to the audience that was printed in the Steel magazine in April 1922. Richter dedicated his statement to, quote, the constructivist groups of Romania, Switzerland, Scandinavia, and Germany, and for Baumann, Viking Egling, and Janko, end quote. In his article on constructivism and architecture in Contemporanul, Marcel Janku references Richter's statement and lays out a brief history of constructivism as originating in Russia with suprematist artists who concentrated on the materials of art making. Then architecture was reborn, he says, through abstract wall reliefs and Elzyzyski's crown. Regarding the abstract wall reliefs, Janku could be referring to Tatlin's reliefs, but also to the abstract reliefs of his own data period. From 1916 to 1919, Yanku worked on a series of reliefs comprised of works such as Relief A7 that you see on the screen that appeared in Data Magazine issue number one from 1917 and also later in the Romanian magazine Punct issue number five from 1924. The experimentation with abstraction led Yanku to join the Association of Radical Artists. Richter founded the association in 1919 in Zurich where they formulated their beliefs about the social power of abstract art to convey humanity's freedom. An exhibition review of Contemporanus 1924 International Exhibition adds that Yanku was, quote, one of the creators of the first constructivist art group, end quote, in 1918, along with Richter, Egling, and Hans Art. Because the exhibition review does not mention a name, the group is either the Association of Radical Artists or the New Life which held exhibitions in major Swiss cities in 1918 and 1919. The fact that the magazine presents Yaku as one of the creators of the first constructivist art group is important for it associates the magazine itself via the magazine's editor, Yanku. He was one of the editors along with uh, Romanian writer Jan Vinea, with the early beginning of constructivism and consequently locates constructivism in the Romanian avant-garde. 
The relief prints that Jan Kub, Maxi, and Brown created for the Romanian Vanguard magazine stands from the tradition of relief printing that Jan Kub first undertook during his Dada period, as seen in his prints in the Dada magazine. Jan Kub's abstract woodcuts and lino cuts influenced the less rigid style of constructivist prints of the Romanian Vanguardist, and also influenced the pervasiveness of these prints in the Romanian magazines. A change from his organic to geometric abstraction is evident in Janku's architectonic forms of his Romanian avant-garde period. For example, in his linocut in Contemporaneul issue number 49, round and angular forms intersect and overlap each other on the same plane. The contrast between the red and blue colors and the blank white and black areas convey some depth as the colors pushed as exact triangles, half circles and cylinders forward in space. But altogether, forms result in a flat two-dimensional object. When compared to the Russian constructivist Elzyski's Prown, one can imagine oneself walking into Prown's vast space and encountering the geometric objects residing in space, like three-dimensional architectural structures. This experience is impossible to imagine in Yanku's compositions and constructions that obstruct the viewer's presence. The viewer perceives the object as a whole from a distance unable to imagine it's materially in real space. Speaking of Prown, Janku wrote in his Constructivism and Architecture article that Lezinski sought, quote, a pure aesthetic body in order to clarify relations of volume and matter, end quote. Although Janku became a prominent architect in interwar Romania, where he built uh, various modernist buildings, his prints lack like a kind of relations of volume and matter that he identifies in Prown. Rather, Janku is more fascinated with constructivism's formal potential to express relations between abstract forms and interests that he conveys in his style of architecture and other constructivist prints. Janku's construction on the cover on Punkt, issue number 13, from February 1925, is composed of a white pattern of swirls, dots, and texture diagonals in a black space that contorts with the shape of the pattern. This abstract composition embodies Janku's preoccupation with conjoining disparate compositional parts of different texture and sizes to create a cohesive object. Moreover, in another line of called, called composition, the architectonic object resides on an expansive background, like a standing building against a skyscape. Janku even added a thick black line at the bottom to differentiate the object from the background and to give it a straight foundation. Yet, due to the two flat ovals at the bottom and the diagonal error cutting through the top triangle, the object stops short of eliciting a three-dimensional architectural object. Yanku is not the only Romanian avant-garde artist whose constructivist line of cut prints emphasize spatial flatness. Image Maxi and Victor Browner combined the constructivist and expressionist forms in their numerous line of cuts and woodcut prints. Maxi's prints are particularly distinct, distinct in their fusion of constructivist and expressionist elements and in the vertical orientation of the composition. For example, in his woodcut print in Contemporaneul issue number 44 from July 1923, several forms, among them a large straight rectangle, a tilted rectangle, and a pentagon, visually pulsate compactly on account of Maxi's ardent texture marks. Maxi fixed these forms around a main focal point, a circular atom-like form with intertwining loops moving around the central white dot. It is not far-fetched together that Maxi aimed to demonstrate mathematical clarity in the equilibrium of converging forms and the depiction of nuclear physics. His atom-like form attracts the surrounding forms to its black void, where the world of the macro as in the rusty marks that signify an organic material like wood, and the macro, micro, as in the small particles unseen with the human eye, these worlds collide. The woodcut print's vertical composition is a feature that reoccurs in the print's essential construction, whose medium is unspecified. Central construction is an extreme example because apart from the vertical composition, its appearance diverges from Maxi's woodcut prints in Contemporaneal issue number 44. 
sexual construction stylized his subjectivity bellies other European artists' constructivist art. Now, with us argue it bellies other Maxi's other constructivist prints as well. The copious stylistic subjective rendering that Maxi undertakes in the print is evident how he, he juxtaposes the stripes, short marks, and what areas into an elaborate pattern set against a black background. More so than his other prints, Maxi does not abstain from imbuing the print with these decorative patterns that transform into a feast for the eyes, as its title, Sexual uh, Construction, suggests. Additionally, there are figurative elements in the black oval in the upper half of the composition, and then the narrow diagonal form in the lower half that materialize into a female body, which Maxi further conveys with a striped and white form that curves alongside the body and makes the body whole from the lower to the upper portion. These figurative elements in Maxi's art of abstract forms morphing into body parts challenges the rigid geometric abstraction of constructivism. Brano's constructivist prints have a particular flatness of forms, more so than in Yanko and Maxi's constructivist art, as exemplified in his line of cut Equilibrium, shown here. Brano disregarded depth altogether when he utilized the stripes motif in his line of cut. As the focal point of the composition, the thick black stripes glide across a tilted square that could also be a diamond form, with a small rectangle in the upper left corner. The stripes hold their dominion against the imposing black square and its additive components. Notably, the line of cut print was on the cover of Contemporary issue number 47, produced by uh, Hungarian artist Lajos Kaszak, likewise has the stripes motif in a composition that conveys an economy of form. Two bare rectangles frame two black squares and one rectangle of different proportions in a slanted composition that, as with the slanted composition in Browner's line of cut, conjures the passing view of a landscape and its buildings flashing in the windows of a speeding train or car. However, unlike Browner, Koshak orchestrates depth in the composition by placing the smaller black rectangles inside the taller ones and a striped rectangle in front of them. The overlapping of geometric forms and positive and negative space is more evident in Browner's punct number 10 line of cut, which is yet another conventional constructivist artwork. The constructivist forms relate to each other in some manner, either by complementing or repelling each other. They bind together in a stable yet dynamic union, dependent on an ordered arrangement through the form's repetition, distance, size, or position. Some of Brenner's prints are more constructivist than others, but when he achieves, like in his punct number 10 line of cut, the balance and order that I think are so imperative to constructivist art, then his constructivist prints are among the most outstanding and refined constructivist art that graces the pages of Romanian avant-garde magazines. For the most part, Browner's prints are not decorative, but sometimes as his line of cut in issue number eight, the flatness is so pronounced and the abstract form so close to uniformity that one may rarely call the print decorative. Clement Grima equates the decorative in painting with a type of uniformity and flatness that is extensive, for instance, uh, in interior design and costume design. Modern artists may take advantage of the decorative, uh, he says, which exhibits the qualities of precision and neatness in their art as long as, quote, forms are sufficiently differentiated and kept in dramatic imbalance, end quote. The line of cut in book number eight appears quite decorative in its transformation of negative and positive space into black and white shapes that look like Matisse's paper cutouts. The harmonious composition revolves around the heart shape, the only route shape in the composition. The identif identifiable sign of the heart may hinder the line of cut from becoming wholly abstract. However, it does not necessarily strip away the line of cut's constructivist label nor does it do so in Maxi's sensualist construction prints. Besides its formal affinities with constructivist art elsewhere in Europe, how is Romanian art, constructivist art connected to constructivism's revolutionary politics, if it is at all? At first sight, Yanko's constructivist prints, as, as with Maxi and Browner's, reside outside the realm of politics. 
the avant-gardists may have been ideologically tied to the left, but they did not transfer their printed images to propaganda posters or attach their political views to their prints in the magazines. However, we get a better sense of their politics in relation to constructivism from the avant-gardist articles in their magazines. In one article, Maxi writes that constructivism is, quote, the aesthetics of the new builder, end quote. Maxi here expresses the redundant idea of constructivism, uh, the idea of the Russian constructivist that the post-World War I industrial advanced environment requires new abstract art. Romanian avant-garde writer Ilaria Varonka states that, quote, constructivism needs streets, cities. The contemporary soul requires a newly constructed city, end quote. Contemporano editor Ion Vinea declares in the manifesto, activist manifesto for the youth, the most important uh, manifesto in the Romanian avant-garde, he says that, quote, Romania is being constructed to what they, with our cities, roads, bridges, the plans that we will build the spirit, rhythm, and style that will shape us, end quote. In terms of constructivism, the Romina Magar does not concre concretely outline, other than the use construct, the word construct, how constructivism will bring about those changes from the standpoint of the Russian Magar as revolutionary constructivism, and how they will bring these changes in the situation outside of art. Perhaps the best way to implementation is through architecture, as Voronka and Vinaya claim. But for Yanku, architecture was more than its utilitarian material of function and proletarian concerns. Yanku's modern style is seen in one of his architectural drawings on the cover of Contemporanul number 5354. The drawing's caption specifies that Yanku designed the building as a countryside studio for Vinaya. With a compact form, held in place by intersecting asymmetrical verticals and horizontals, the seal reminds us of one of Yanku's constructivist objects in his prints. It is doubtful whether Yanku had the proletarian in mind when he designed his buildings. He was undoubtedly not approaching modern architecture as that with which to change the structure of society. The buildings Yanku designed ranged from private residences of higher class clients to apartment buildings of middle-class city dwellers. To conclude, the constructivism of the Romanian avant-garde, exemplified by Yanku, Maxi, and Browner, uh, and their prints differs from other artists' constructivist art in Europe, and how much they proliferated constructivism through prints, the leading carrier of the Romanian constructivist forms, and how little political meaning they attached to their constructivist prints. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking all the organizers of this event for having me here today. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this symposium. Um, so I'll start here with a short history and presentation of the portfolio to specify what the medium actually entails before giving an overview of what place and purpose were given to the portfolio format in avant-garde artistic practices, so both individual and collective, and how this specific form aligned and even participated in shaping various discourses, both from and about the avant-garde. So originally, the portfolio was a means of protecting and carrying, conserving and curating works of art on paper. Yet by the turn of the 19th century, artists reclaimed it and dedicated it to the print series, or suite, and it became an artistic medium and even an art object in its own right. So rather than using it as a simple recipient or material support for the print, artists intentionally created portfolios like they would paintings or sculptures, uh, those giving the form an autonomous artistic substance and status. Max Klinger, with his famous portfolios, of which you see an example here, uh, marks the beginning of this trend in the German-speaking area, and he provided a model that was consistently used thereafter. So while the portfolios served as a means and token of unity for the prints uh, cycles they contained, they also permitted to extract and exhibit the prints uh, together or individually as painting substitutes. 
And as such, the portfolio was distributed in artistic circuits, mainly through the art gallery and the art or amateurs associations. But it was also circulated through a literary network, where it was produced and sold by publishers and booksellers who specialize in so-called schöne Bücher, or beautiful coffee table books, and other limited editions. In this context, it was understood as a luxury editorial format, and so it can be considered generally that the portfolio is a bibliophilic art object. The materials uh, used for portfolio covers range from the simple plain cardboard sleeve to ornate papers, fabrics, or finely wrought leather, while some were even decorated with an original print uh, by the artist, as you can see here with these few examples. So there were two main types of portfolios, corresponding to the individual portfolio containing the prints of a single artist and the collective portfolios uh, created sorry, or gathering prints by several artists. A large proportion of them also borrowed from the book format, featuring title pages, colophons, tables of contents, and prefaces, as you can see here with this example by Hilbig. Uh, yet the prints they contained were never bound to each other or to their cover, and it's mainly this aspect that differentiates the portfolio from other forms, like the book or the album. So the adoption of the portfolio as full-fledged art form by the avant-garde was most often progressive. It was used at first for practical reasons, uh, so still mainly considered as a means of diffusion of painted works through the transposition of motifs and compositions in print. Yet in this process, the artists soon discovered the potentialities of both paper and the portfolios, which were then appropriated as true experimental medium. So, for example, in response to a letter from Hervat Valden about a portfolio gathering miscellaneous lithographies uh, that were previously published in the magazine Der Sturm, Oskar Kokoschka wrote, I quote, send them to the French, this portfolio, potentially even completely free, propaganda according to the old principle. So the old principle described here, if already acknowledged as such, old, still illustrates the portfolio as nothing more than a material and practical means of presentation for selected works. Then three years later, in 1916, Kokoschka was producing and publishing uh, portfolios like the Beyond Columbus, or this one you see here, O Eternity, fully investing the medium as a complete artistic form in which he experimented with narrative through the intermedial association of word, image, and music. A similar process is noticeable in Otto Dix's use of the portfolio, here especially uh, with the titles. So, for example, earlier works were descriptive, and they were called uh, etchings, one, two, or three, while later ones, like these you see here on the screen, uh, called becoming, werden, or uh, death and resurrection, are more elaborate, thematic, and almost narrative, and which goes to show how Dix had, by then, himself invested in the portfolio as a true artistic form. Medium. So with every new exploration of the portfolio's potentialities by specific movements, such as constructivism and data that we'll talk about here, the form was charged with varying function and value, directly identifying with that movement's representative intents and ideals. And so in this, the distinct ways in which each avant-garde approached the exhibition of their portfolios is particularly revealing. So it is with and within the portfolio that Elisitsky elaborated the brown form and concept through a renaming, or rather a de- or unnaming, of older compositions that were previously identified as architectural. For example, here, this uh, watercolor from 1919 called Bridge One, as it passes in the portfolio, becomes brown A1, same composition. As he explains it, uh, the goal of Brown was, I quote, the creative manipulation of form, thus also the mastering of space, through the economic construction of transfigured material. So the portfolio, according to Lisitsky's uh, constructivist agenda, was used as a transformative medium to be understood as an environment or a milieu where form was artistically neutralized and opened up to the creative possibilities of Brown. This creative openness is directly reflected and literally supported by the material openness of the portfolio. And as for the manipulation aspect, the portfolio's dual function as exhibited art form and readable object emphasizes a physical relationship or manipulation between the viewer and the works. 
The prints could in fact be extracted and seen in varying positions, so vertically on a wall, laying horizontally on a table, or even probably in movement, being rotated in the viewer's hands, as Lisiski intended it, by indicating uh, with small marks on the prints the various possible orientations of his prints. Now, the fact that the portfolio covers were exhibited alongside their prints goes to show the importance that was accorded to the portfolio as medium and art form specifically, and especially uh, in Lizitsky's practice in terms of the Brown's uh, relationship to typography, typography sorry, also. Now, looking at George Gross's portfolios in the context of the first international data fair in Berlin in 1920, we can see that this emphasis on functional versatility uh, was here also a decisive aspect of the use of the portfolio as medium, and it served as a form of artistic direction uh, of the viewer's experience of the object. But in a data context, uh, rather than serving as an aestheticizing platform, the portfolio called attention, on the contrary, to the objectified and even commodified uh, dimension of art, revealing the central and meaningful role of the material support or medium in artistic practices. So two portfolios are presented here. The God with Us portfolio was displayed on the table on the right at the entrance, and the small George Gross portfolio was exhibited on the wall opposite. Although significantly, the print that Gross chose to present on the wall of the exhibition space is in fact the table of contents of his small George Gross portfolio, which was designed by John Hartfield. It is the only print of this port portfolio that was shown, but as it contains the titles of all the other prints, it symbolizes the unity of the form, while at the same time subverting classical exhibition displays by not actually showing the artworks. And the subversion is then pursued with the God with Us portfolio, which was laid on the table and advertised as an object again to be manipulated and bought uh, by the viewers, which perpetuates Dada's rejection of the artwork entity, uh, which in a data practice becomes an erzeugnis or a product. The material versatility and multidimensionality, as it were, of the portfolio was here also reflected in the multilingual legends of the prints in the God with Us portfolio, which were in uh, French, English and German. And all this, of course, uh, is directly in line with Dada's and this specific exhibition, uh, exhibition's international character. So all the examples I've discussed so far are uh, individual portfolios created each by a single artist, yet uh, one major characteristic of the historical avant-garde is, of course, the group. And in this context, the portfolio's capacity to act as a collective artwork makes it a most appropriate form to represent such gatherings. So, for example, in 1920, the members of the Dresden Secession created and distributed a collective portfolios, portfolio sorry, of original prints. And this becomes particularly significant in light of the group's own ethos, as it was proclaimed in the catalogue of their first exhibition in 1919, which I quote, working collectively but preserving the freedom of the individual, we intend to seek and to find a new expression. So this statement parallels precisely the material constitution of the portfolio, which gathers a collection of prints while promoting the autonomy or the freedom of each individual unbound sheet. Looking at some of the contributions, it's easy to recognize, recognize how this new expression constitutes a formal or a stylistic common thread that still allows for individual experimentation through the choice of different techniques, such as woodcut or engraving here, uh, and of course in terms of subject matter also. Especially suited also to the communication habits of the avant-garde, the portfolio offered within the artwork itself the possibility to feature textual components and it was regularly used to defend and spread ideas in the form of manifestos, programs, prefaces, introductions and dedications, which were either composed by the artists themselves or in association with a writer, a poet or another uh, literary personality. So with the portfolio, artists were able to take full advantage of the paper medium with its own dual or dialectical nature, being both the material support for text and image, thus achieving a form of unity between idea and form. And in comparison with other paper format, like the catalog, the periodical, or the pamphlet, and so on, the avant-garde uh, that the avant-garde used, above all as a medium, 
The portfolio with its unbound original prints constituted an artwork in itself and thus offered arguably uh, increased artistic value as well as, again, functional versatility. Now, this idea and ideal of the collective or the community was also regularly associated with an international or a transnational dimension, as was the case of the uh, avant-garde groups like SEMA and their FELS, who significantly also elected the portfolio as their primary means of collective expression. So SEMA was an art society created in 1911 in Munich, devoted to gathering a specifically international community of creators from the visual arts, architecture, literature and music. And among its most famous uh, members are, for example, the Russian Robert Genin, uh, the American Frank Herman, the Swiss Paul Klee, uh, the Polish Eugene Zak, the Italian Luigi Redelli and the Austrians Egon Schiele and Max Oppenheimer. So in 1912, a portfolio that you see here of prints was published to promote the society through the work of its visual artists. Looking at uh, these contributions, some of them, it's remarkable that despite being all marked with the SEMA tree-like signet and produced in the same technique of the lithography, the many different styles and subjects seem to correspond largely to a celebration of their proclaimed variety. So the portfolio's uh, general presentation uh, with the choice of text placement and typography uh, and so on remain rather simple in style, which um, offered a neutral backdrop, again, uh, for this variety. Now, the group uh, Der Fels was itself constituted in 1921, and although it was more restricted in scope, it was still binational and included four German art artists, uh, Bonstert, Furken, Wöhlen, uh, Hilke, and the Austrian Kari Hauser. Der Fels published a series of eight portfolios between 1921 and 1924, and in comparison, uh, we can see here uh, that Der Fels clearly emphasized visual cohesion, cohesion sorry, in their portfolios, um, and the use of a single technique for each series, most often lithography or woodcut, like here, feeds, uh, this use of a single technique feeds into the intentional uh, stylistic and occasionally thematic unity. Moreover, the use of variations of the same frontispiece for six of the eight portfolios uh, adds to this systematized and programmatic diffusion of both the group's art and their public image. And so, although different from the rest, uh, the frontispiece for the last portfolio is symbolically interesting for its auto-referential representation of the portfolio being carried by a walking figure. So this motif played with the defining portability of the portfolio, meaning literally leaf or sheet carrier, and it shows the portfolio as an object in movement, a medium of transport and transmission. So while in the case of SEMA, the international aspect was expressed in the group's constitution and incarnated in the portfolio's united multiplicity, for the FELS, the transnational dimension was actually experimented and experienced through their uh, touring portfolio's exhibitions. The SEMA portfolio was primarily intended as a complement to the group's local painting exhibitions in Germany, whereas the portfolios of the FELS constituted themselves the exhibitions and exhibition items, whose itinerary established uh, strategic ne networks of promotion and dissemination of their art across borders. And in this sense, the portfolio also facilitated and acted the overpassing of the artistic center and the identification of groups or movements with uh, specific cities, like the Berlin, Munich, or Vienna secessions, for example. And it incarnated this typical trait of the avant-garde in the German-speaking area, especially in the 20s, who largely invested the provinces. But beyond the avant-garde's own practices and self-reflecting uh, reflective discourses, the portfolio was also used for editorial projects for which it served as a platform for an external discourse shaping a general idea of the avant-garde. And this use of the portfolio's uh, portfolio by editors demonstrates another understanding of the collective nature of the form and its relationship to the avant-garde. In this context, the more traditional approach of the portfolio as object of collection was emphasized. So often published as part of series, the portfolio was not only a collection of prints, but itself a collectible item. 
The Bauhaus Neue Europäische Grafik Portfolio Series that you see here was still somewhat in between the artists group project, the editorial project and the institutional project. Lionel Feininger, who was the master of the, Prince, uh, the Bauhaus Print Workshop, was also appointed artistic director of this project, which was in consequence uh, overseen directly by an artist, but it was not exclusively devoted to the production of the Bauhaus members or to any specific pre-established group or artistic movement. Reflecting the school's ethos, it was transnational in scope and presented the works of major representatives of the so-called European avant-garde with a classification by country, namely Germany, France, Holland, Italy and Russia. The portfolio was used here simultaneously as a sort of centralizing platform, so on one hand receiving and uniting a previously uh, nationally isolated production, and on the other hand as a means of distribution and dissemination of the same artistic content. But the relative distance of its editorial nature, as well as its production by an art school, also made it a tool for an institutionalized uh, definition or circumscription of the contemporary avant-garde. Now, this is my last point. Paul Westheim, the German editor of the art magazine Das Kunstblatt, launched in 1918 a new editorial project called Die Schaffenden, or The Creators, a magazine, magazine in portfolio form. In the program for this publication, he explains that, I quote, the intention is to provide an oriented overview of the contemporary graphic production. Die Schaffenden, like das Kunstblatt, is at the service of the young, the fresh, the liveliest developments of the current artistic spirit. So in this context, and in the context of this oriented or selective process, typical of the editorial method, the portfolio was not only a means of promotion, but also served as a discursive platform for the critical definition of the avant-garde more generally. Now to conclude, at a time when paper was so omnipresent on the German artistic scene and in the cultural landscape at large that it was often compared to a tidal wave or a flood, the portfolio offered a new definite space for the avant-garde uh, experiment, experimentations, as well as a platform for the definition of such artistic practices. So taking advantage of the medium's intermediate or ambivalent nature, it could function both as an open, free artistic form and as a means of somewhat rigorous classification. Thank you very much.